It is the truth. God doesn't ask for our perfection. Through Christ, he simply asks, are you available? And Billy, thank you for being available to be here. At the conclusion of the service, there'll be a kind of a recalled church conference uh, uh, to uh, uh, have a presentation from the personnel team, and, and you'll be able to vote. The ballots are not already pre-filled. This isn't Louisiana. We're close, but it's not Louisiana. Uh, so they'll have that opportunity to catch. I served a church in Louisiana. I can make that joke a little bit. So, but, but seriously, uh, the, the opportunity to move forward is another step along the journey. And so thank you for that, Billy. And just kind of coincidentally, uh, the church I was serving prior to here after I'd met uh, with uh, the committee and we talked, we were praying through the process, our first Sunday back to in-person worship, that song was sung. And the Lord just went, Shunk. okay, you're available, go. Well, today in the church is often called Palm Sunday, but it's more than that. It's a, uh, really a reminder. We gather every Sunday to celebrate the story of what Christ has done for us. And uh, the title of today is Path, the Way of Love on on the screen is a photo I took of a, of a pathway on the hillside coming up from the Mount of Olives into Jerusalem. I took that on the last trip, and, and they'd excavated it not, not too terribly long ago. And although there's no certain evidence that that's exactly the path Jesus took on the way into Jerusalem, there aren't any stray first century cloaks lying along the side of the road or palm branches or even scuffs from the little uh, colt's hooves that carried Christ, they do know with all certainty that path was there at that time. Those stones were there at that time, and more on that later. But if you're a hiker or a hunter, you, you know about trails, right? As a, a hunter, you know there's a trail that takes you to your favorite hunting spot, your favorite blind, and and, you know, it takes a little while to get there. If it was easy to get to the stand to see the deer, if there was like a parking lot and a paved path going in and signs along the way, they would call that a zoo. As a hiker, I can tell you the trails don't always follow the easiest path. They go around and sometimes over obstacles. They're rocky along the way. And if it was easy to get there, they'd call that just a highway that people would speed along, but there's a bit of joy in the difficulty of the journey that you celebrate when you get to the view. And so today we find ourselves along the path of the incarnation, seeing Jesus both in joy and be burdened by the view of what's right in front but the view even further than most can see at the moment. So we're in Luke 19, verses 28 through 48. I'm not going to read the whole text there for you, for some of it is familiar. But the path of the incarnation always led to the place where Jesus would show everyone the love of God, show his compassion for others, and show us as his followers, as disciples, how to live, that he would be the way. And it's really important for us to understand up front that this was a necessary path. There aren't multiple paths to the heart of God and to salvation and to redemption. And I don't say that as a, a statement of entitlement or ego uh, at all, but really as a, an honest sense of awareness that the burden is ours to communicate clearly that this path mattered. There was no way around the cross and the tomb and the emptying of it. There is no other way to be saved other than by the name of Jesus Christ. And our heart might yearn for others to know that too. We aren't a club with an exclusive entry. We are a community with wide open doors for all to come to know Christ. So would you bow with me prayer and prayer as we get ready to look at the text today. God, we pause for a bit to remember as we do that we don't have to beg, plead, or say a prayer in the right way to have your presence among us. You are here. 
But God, we need to yield ourselves to be available to your presence, to your proclamation, and to your celebration, to your word. In Jesus' name I pray. And we all said, amen. Um, How do you feel when you're almost home? Like you've been on a long journey. Are you like the horse that runs to the barn? I mean, I own horses for a little while, and and I learned you don't feed the horse every time you get back from a ride. That's a bad habit. I actually helped a guy with some horses that had that habit one time, and it nearly killed me because that horse sees the barn when you turn around, and it will take off running. And I will tell you from experience, if it's a trained cutting horse, that is a scary experience. But when you head home, do you find yourself with a bit of tunnel vision, not aware of the neighbor's houses in the yards as you are almost home? You're just like, I'm almost home. I just want to get to my place. I just want to get to my chair. I just want to get to my bed. I just want to get to my cooking. I just want to get to my remote control. Whatever it is, man, you're headed home, and if you're not careful, you miss the last part of the journey. And it's important not to miss the last part of the journey with Jesus. So in in Luke 19, verses 28 through 48, is a passage that's partly very familiar to us. We, We know the story about Jesus sending his disciples on ahead. Jesus is at Bethphage and Bethany, just over the hill from Jerusalem at what was often called the outer gates, you know, the almost Jerusalem place, the, the suburbs, we might, might even call it, the metroplex of Jerusalem. And he sends those disciples on ahead, and they gather the cult that's there, saying the Lord needs this, and they bring it back. Jesus gets on the cult, and he goes into town. They put their cloaks on it, cloaks on it as a form of a saddle. And as he gets along the way, the people take really their best clothing possession. They didn't have multiple garments like we do. They take their outer garment, lay it on the path to settle the dust. They bring the palm branches to soften the path as the colt makes its way along. But even more than that, they shout joyfully in loud voices, giving God the praise for all the miracles they had seen. And they say, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. I mean, you guys were given praise a while ago, but turn it up past 11 and then some. The volume was ringing off the hills around Jerusalem that day, and the Pharisees in the crowd, the religionists, I call them, the curators, the caretakers of of the, the idea of religion and the rules and regulations of how to seem appropriate to God and others. And they say, teacher, rebuke your disciples. And Jesus says to them, I tell you, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Let me explain what's going on ever so briefly. The arrival of the Messiah was known well and desired long by all God's creation. The fall of humankind is why we can look. Our sin has caused everything to be out of sync and out of step with the Creator and the Sustainer and the Redeemer. It is why illness rages. It is why storms destroy We are not living on a place in a community that is in the perfect will of God yet. Paul goes on to say, all creation groans with the longing. The theological statement is that he has reconciled all creation to himself. So even the rocks on the road are saying, it's going to finally be right here. Now I know they're inanimate objects, but the hand of the creator is on God's creation. And that is us. And in that recognition, Jesus tells them that truth And he moves forward in verse 41 
approaching Jerusalem, and he sees the city. Everybody's shouting. Everyone is celebrating. But as he sees the city, he weeps over it and says, If you, even you, had only not known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes, the days will come when your enemies will build an embankment against you, encircle you, and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Jesus, with tears in his eyes, not disdain in his voice, proclaims the occurrence that is going to come because of the rebellion of the people of God. Those whom God has said he would make a great and mighty nation in the first Abrahamic covenant had excluded themselves from the rest of the world and forgotten the second part where it said, through whom all the nations of the world might come to salvation. So in these people, their eyes were hidden. They could not know God's coming, and Jesus proclaims what we might call the wrath of God. Now, it's important to know wrath is not God's desire. God does not go around looking to smite or to catch one in the act and destroy and devour. Ours is not the God of destruction, but of creation and restoration. Wrath, I can best understand it, is this way. Wrath is the holiness of God interacting with the whole unholiness of our sin. Light makes no apology for being light when it chases the darkness away from the room. But that, that point, that encounter of light with darkness is what might feel like wrath to the darkness, but is really holiness taking its rightful place. And so Jesus enters on, and he enters the temple courts, and it says he began to drive out those who were selling. It is written, he said to them, my house will be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. Now remember, I have told you when Jesus quotes from the Old Testament or Paul or the other apostles do as well in Scripture, they don't have the ability of saying Isaiah 56, verses 6 and 7. They don't, don't have those verses there. They are quoting a familiar section of the passage that would evoke to mind the entire story. It's like when someone quotes a line from a movie to get you to think of the whole story of the movie. But this is their story. And when Jesus is quoting this nation, uh, and, and, Jer and he speaks of it in, from Isaiah 56 or Jeremiah 7, verses 11 and 12, he says, This house which bears my name has become a den of robbers to you. He says, But I have been watching, declares the Lord. In Isaiah 56, he speaks of those who have come from the nation, the foreigners around them who have come to worship the most high God because God's house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. And yet, they had encircled it about with exclusivity and walls. They were taking advantage of those who had journeyed in, those tables that were set up where the money changers were in the temple that we have sometimes contemporized in to other things that we want to be religious -y about uh, these days. What really was happening was people who thought they were in the know were being disdainful of those without. Why, those hillbillies from Galilee are coming here. We want to make it easy for them so that they don't have to bring whatever kind of second rate offering they're going to be. We'll have the right thing for them to offer to God for sale at just a nominal profit. Or those who have to come and bring drachmas from the Greek diaspora well, they'd need to convert that into shekels for the temple offering. So for an exchange rate 
fee, we'll convert that to the appropriate currency. Humankind has excelled at elevating oneself over others for our perceived differences across generations, across ethnic groups, across economic statuses. We look for things to differentiate us, and I can make the list very long and make you very uncomfortable, but you know it's real. But the one place that was never intended to be, and I've read the end of the book, and it's not the place it will be forever, is in the community of God. All peoples. I love looking out at church when I preach on Sunday because, as you've heard me say, it is that place where really, you know, y'all might be in some groups or clubs or schools that you go to together, but outside of being followers of Christ with a commonality and a community of faith, here, there's not a really good reason all you people would get together for an hour on Sunday morning, right? Outside of Christ. He brings us together, and he wants that for all. The text ends with this. Every day, he being Jesus, was teaching at the temple, but the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the leaders among the people were trying to kill him. Shocker. This is the mission. This is the path, the heading to the cross that Jesus has. But those people who are supposed to be people of God want to cut off which inconveniences them. It says, yet they could not find any way to do it because all the people hung on his words. I got to tell you, as a father, as a husband, and as a preacher, I think that would be a pretty cool thing if people just hung on your words. Oh, daddy, tell us more what to do. You with me, parents? They don't hang on your words. And it's nice of you to listen to me for a little while on a Sunday. But these folks are engaged. For truthfully, all eternity counts on hearing Jesus. And they are there few things to kind of just kind of debrief and, and back this up and unpack it for us ever so briefly, because I know you're here for the food and this food. I have a question for you. You know, I love it when my team wins, especially when both basketball teams make it into the Elite Eight, and that's a great thing. Oh, come on. <laughs> just allow me a little bit. But seriously, I love it when a team wins, especially if it's a kid's team. I mean, kids can go crazy, whether it's t-ball, coach pitch, or a relay race, if they win. I love it. It's like uh, this coming Friday, what Ashley has come up with for Egg the Town, which is a great way for that to happen, to get families together and to come and hear the story and celebrate. I mean, the kids, they're going to get eggs with candy in them. They can buy those any time. But to get that prize, that's just awesome. Kids love that. That's what's happening with this crowd. Man, they are celebrating the arrival of the Savior. Their hope of the ages is consummated in the arrival of Christ, the Messiah, as much as they could understand what was happening in their expectation. This is what it's been building toward. There are people in this crowd that had journeyed in that were like, Oh, were you there? Yeah, I had some of that bread and that fish. Wow. Were you there? Yeah, that water thing into wine, that was incredible. Were, were you there when that little girl was raised to life? Yes, I was, I was in the crowd. Oh, that's nothing. I got dirt on my head when they lowered that guy through the roof. I mean, these people knew the stories. And they can't wait to see what happens next. So the praise is high. But Jesus, the Savior, is going higher. 
higher than the Mount of Olives, higher than the Mount of Calvary, higher than the Mount of Ascension, higher to the highest heavens, to the glory of God, the view is getting even better. And he wants to take us with him. He wants us to be a part of that journey. And I get that. I've I've been on trails before, and I hope to go on one in a few weeks with my son that I've been on before, and you get to some places that are a beautiful view, and on your first hike, on your way up the journey, there are people on their way down from the top of Guadalupe Peak, the highest peak in Texas, and they're on their way down, and you're on your way up looking at the view, and they're like, oh, no, no, don't stop here. Keep going. It gets better. And so I want to tell you, as a follower of Jesus Christ, um, I'm very sorry if anyone ever told you that the best part of the journey was the day you decided to follow Jesus and the day you were baptized. I mean, I love hearing people's stories, but it makes me sad when the story ends with the day they were baptized, because there's so much more after that. That's just That's just the identification that you're on the right path. Keep going as a follower of Christ. I mean, that's the irony of it saying Baptist on our sign out front, is we don't believe baptism is the ultimate thing that saves you. It's Jesus that did that, and you believe him, and you follow him. I mean, the the church is not to be a monument to what Jesus has done, but a movement of people following Jesus. And so the crowd was getting that. The disciples were getting that. Those Pharisees and religious leaders were, were not. Jesus is going further. I have another question for you. This one's a little harder. Are you worried about anything or anyone right now? Yes, you're human. Something's got you. Something worries you. Something consumes you. Something gets you. And you have this compassion for that, this sense of suffering with that. Your heart is concerned about that. Jesus' heart was concerned for the lost, not just of Jerusalem, but of the world. For he knows that judgment is coming. The scriptures are very clear that this, our Savior, who is appointed as the righteous judge, the one able to give the right declaration that has the authority to do so, will return to judge, as the King James says it and makes a good Western movie title, the quick and the dead. I served with a judge in high school. And that man was tough. Criminal District Court number four, Judge Meade, when he entered the courtroom, you knew he was going to render judgment. But I also knew his heart. He would rather not have to condemn, but rather have compassion upon those that were there. And Jesus, who is going higher, is going further than the judgment for he is going to take the judgment of sin upon himself. To carry upon himself the weight of the cross and the weight of the sin of all humankind and to carry that sin to the cross and to be the atoning sacrifice for all sin ever committed, ever sin that would be committed, so that it all could be laid at the throne of God the Father and that all who would believe And that sacrifice for them would receive the compassion of God, realize his heart of concern for us, and that his judgment has been carried out upon the cross and will not be carried out upon us. That's the truth we we need to know. That's what it is to be a follower of Christ. That you believe it's not about piling up enough good works anymore. But it's about faithfully following Christ well because he has done all the good for you. That said, then, as a follower of Jesus Christ, what does an average Christian look like? And I don't mean average like so-so. I mean just like average. What do you you think a Christian looks like? 
Now, here's the thing. The commitment of Christ was to be a part of calling all peoples, all homes to him. Paul goes on to write of this, that in Jesus there is no Jew nor Gentile, no male nor female, that there is no foreigner or close in, that in Christ all have been brought together in him. That he is about calling people from all nations. And so there is no perfect nation that has this down. The average Christian in the world today, actually, if you were to have kind of like a like a fulcrum on the lever, would be some lady, sweet little Christian lady going to a church in Africa today. I mean, really, you want to think that the average Christian in the world looks like us, but the Baptist World Alliance will tell you that there are millions upon millions of those who would even identify as Baptists that are in nations nowhere like the one in which we reside. And so we must remember that. And it always humbles me to think about this. Of what nation and of what language and of what appearance did someone look like that told someone that told someone that told someone that told someone someone until finally down that trail it came to someone telling me about Jesus? I'm pretty sure there are a whole lot of people in that path that didn't look like me. Plenty of people in that path that weren't where I'm from, that didn't speak good Texan. And so where will that path go from you? Do you believe all homes are called? If you do, then you see it with like passion, the celebration and the commitment of Christ. For that's what community is. And then we have to close with asking our question is, are we too familiar with this story? Are we too familiar with Jesus? Do we, what, what would it take to get us re-excited about Jesus? Now, I, I don't really know the magic formula for that or how that would work, but I remember in college, uh, I had a, a poster on the wall that said, whenever I feel like studying, I lay down until the feeling goes away. But the other side of that is this truism. It is much better to act yourself into a new way of feeling than to just hope you feel like acting a new way. So from the story, we see that this. One, if if you want to get re-excited about Christ, pray. Pray. Have a safe place to pray. Get in communication with God Pour out your heart. Use whatever you must say and say, God, this is my praise for you. This is my desire, my earnest hope for you. Read God's word every day. Don't let yourself get discouraged by being on some reading plan that gets you to 2 Chronicles and you get all tangled up in the begets and begots. No, just read God's word. Get in the gospels. Find out what is being said by Jesus. Hang on his every word. And then just hear what Jesus says and do it. There's no telling where it will lead you, but I do know where the path will end up. Don't you? At the face of our Savior Jesus Christ, saying, well done, welcome. We're going to sing a song of commitment, just kind of a, uh, uh, at the end as we close. And uh, as we sing that and Mark leads us, I'd like to invite you to stand with me in a word of prayer. And then after that, we'll enter into our time of church conference. Uh, Father, I thank you for the celebration of the day. For really, this church, not only our heritage, but our hope, not where, just where we've been, but where we're headed, for how you work through us now. And so, God, I thank you that Jesus didn't see the end at the cheers of the crowd, but went on to the cross. So in him we have our hope. In him we live. In him we have our path. In him we have a way made. In Jesus' name, amen.